I'm thinking back, you know, two years ago, looking out at puppets in the, in the congregation, and Joseph and I were trying to video and, and get services up online. Wow. We've come a long way, haven't we? It's amazing where we are today. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be preaching out of the book of John today. And Delma already read to us the passages of Scripture that we're going to be looking at, which is from John 19, starting at verse 28 through 37. And I entitled the sermon today um, based off of a uh, devotional that I was reading. And the, the author of the devotional, I name just lost it, um, said, Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. And as you read through the devotional, he, he put some thoughts down. And, you know, as he hung on this cross... Jesus cried out, the Bible tells us in, in, in the Greek, he cried out a word, to telestai. And to telestai is, is, is the word meaning, it is finished. And for years, we've had liberal theologians, liberal unbelievers, whatever you want to call them, have argued that, see, this is proof right here that Jesus was defeated at Calvary, not that he was victorious. And so this, this argument's um, been out there for a long time, and they will tell you that it was a cry of defeat. But, I love that word, so, just, but the word to telestai means the work is complete. It wasn't a cry of defeat or despair, but it is a, a statement that would have been used when there was a deal reached between two parties and both parties were satisfied. So maybe, um, you know, my, my wife was going to go and, and, and buy me that classic car that I really want, right? And so she works out the deal with the owner of the car and they shake hands and they would say, Tetelestai, it's completed, it is finished. They're both satisfied, they're happy with it. And so when Jesus says it is finished or Tetelestai, what he means by this is that God, God the Father in heaven is now satisfied with the work. He is now satisfied with what Jesus Christ, his son, has done on the cross. God is accepting his son's death, and he's accepting the shed blood of his son as the perfect payment for our sins. So we need to understand before we dive into this that it's this again, it's not a cry of defeat. When Jesus cries out to tell us die or it is finished, he's telling the world, he's telling everybody who's there who can see him, who are going to read these words, that the price has been paid and it is accomplished. It is completed now. But and this is from for the title of the sermon here. But he's not done. He's not finished. It is finished. But Jesus is not finished. That's why we can sing because he lives. That's why we can sing he arose because he's not finished. He's still alive today. He's still interceding on our behalf. He's still working in the hearts and the lives of people today. Hallelujah. And so when he says it is finished, what is he talking about here? So the first thing I want to look at is that what the, just the, the, the agony and the pain and, 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 and all of the suffering that happened at Calvary on that cross. We can't even begin to imagine what Jesus went through on that cross. Verse 28 says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Because he had just gone through the most brutal, most unbelievable um, a situation any, any person could ever go through. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was just absolutely ripped to shreds. We can't even begin to imagine that. We can't begin to imagine the pain and the agony that he went through. But I honestly think... I. I I've done sermons before where we focus on the, the medical crucifixion of Jesus. We've talked about that, of just what he physically went through. But I want to focus in on something else that Matthew brings to light in the book of Matthew, Matthew 27, verse 46. And I think this is very telling and this is very uh, important for us to understand. I think the most painful thing that Jesus went through outside of that physical pain was the judgment that was laid upon him by his father. 
See, Matthew 27, 46, it says, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He cries out and he says, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, for the first time as he's hanging on the cross, he now has become the sins of all the world. Every sin. Second Corinthians, Paul writes to us in 521, he says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As he hung on that cross, let me back up. In the garden, you guys remember Jesus is praying in the garden and he says, Father, not my will but thine be done. If this cup can pass from me, can pass by me. That cup was full of all of the wrath. It was full of all of the sin. All of the judgment that was going to be placed upon humanity was in that cup. And Jesus had to drink from that cup. He didn't do anything. He's not the one that deserved it. You, me, we're the ones that deserve it. But God had to judge Jesus as if he were every sinner that ever lived for all humanity. For the first time ever in Jesus' life, he's separated from his father. There is now a chasm between the two of them. God can no longer even look upon his son because of the sin of all humanity. See, Jesus had to experience every man's death and every man's hell while he was on the cross. That's the agony of the cross. And I think it's so important and so telling for us to understand that he was separated from his father. Um, Randy Alcorn has, has, has a book out there called Heaven, and he, it, it, it paints a beautiful picture. We, we all have these ideas of what we think heaven's going to be like, right? We think, oh, it's going to be glory. We're going to be running through fields of, you know, lavender or whatever and dancing and singing Sound of Music songs or whatever. And I, I don't know. You, you pick whatever you want, right? Everybody has their own view. And he talks about what heaven won't be like. Because if you're not in heaven, you are eternally and forever separated from God. It, think, think of the most lonely, dark place you've ever been. That's where Jesus was right here. There was nobody there to come up and say, hey, buddy, it's okay. It's all right. Just a little bit longer on the cross, Jesus. It's okay. We still love you, buddy. There's nobody. You are completely isolated. You're not going to be, as one of my buddies used to say after I got saved, he'd say, you know, I said, do the whole gospel plan with him. And he says, well, I'll save you a seat by the fire. You know, there ain't going to be anybody by the fire with you. You are eternally separated from everything. So why did Jesus have to suffer these things? Why? Why does our God have to do this? Or he chooses to do this. He chooses to do this because he loves us. He loves you. He loves his creation. Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, what? Christ died for each and every one of us. Pastor Josh Bice says this, the horror of the cross was not to provide us with a formula to help us overcome physical sickness or disease so that we can live our best life now. It was to save us from the penalty of sin and the curse of a second death in eternity. So God died not so I can, you know, have a new car, have a big house, do all of these things. And you, you, you've seen the preachers on TV, you know, if you sow a hundred, I'll get you a thousand, right? You know, your best life now, that's not what we're doing here. Christ died so I don't have to pay the price. I don't have to pay the price for the penalty of sin and the curse of death and second eternity because he loves you. He died for your sins. So you don't have to do it and you can live with him forever in eternity. As I said on Friday, there's no greater plan than this. I've asked people and nobody can give me a better answer. The best answer is, well, you die and you die. Okay. What happens next? Oh, you're, just, you're just worm food. You know, you're, you're, it just stops. It ceases. 
I'm sorry. I can't look at this. I can't look at this building. I can't look at these people sitting out here. I can't look at the trees and the birds and the stars and the moon this morning and the sun rising that does it every single day and say, it just is an accident that we're here just because some dust and some dirt slammed together and, and the goo began to evolve over billions and billions of years and poof, there I am. And then poof, there I'm gone. There's more to it than that. And the only plan that I know of that guarantees me an eternal life is Jesus Christ. There's none other out there. And so we look and we see it is finished. The agony, the pain, the suffering is done. He paid that price. And then we see that the plan is finished. And people say, what do you mean by the plan? The Romans did this. You know, the Jews did this. No, this is from the beginning of time. We can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. God set a plan in motion for his son to come and die for sinners. At the very beginning of creation. Even when he was forming and fashioning the, 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 the round sphere we call home. And he was placing life upon this. He knew in his mind, he knew exactly what his creation was going to do. He knew exactly what he was going to do to redeem and pay, buy back that creation. And so in Genesis 3.15, after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, Jesus, or, uh, God, God says, I will put an en enmity between you and this woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He, this is that foreshadowing of Jesus to come. This is the one who is going to come and defeat the enemy and crush the head of the serpent. See, everything God has done through the, the history of time, everything points to the day when Jesus would lay down his life on the cross. When he would willingly lay down his life on the cross. Nobody forced him. He went, the word tells us, as a lamb who was taken to slaughter. He fulfilled scripture after scripture after scripture. All these prophecies. And see, since the garden, since that Adam and Eve in the garden, death, suffering, and bloodshed have been a part of mankind coming to God. And you say, well, where do you get that? Just right there in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, you know, Everybody gets this idea in their head, and we, we do a terrible job with kids, I think, on this one. When we talk about Adam and Eve in the garden, you see Adam and Eve in the garden, and there's Adam and Eve, and they're, and they're dressed in what? Fig leaves. Yeah, they, they, they're wearing fig leaves, right? But if we read Genesis 3.21, it says that the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. We see recorded right here the first blood offering, the first blood sacrifice. Adam and Eve had never seen bloodshed. They'd never seen suffering. Can you imagine the horror in their eyes as they hear the cries of the animal giving up its lifeblood and then taking the skin from the body and God clothes them and covers them with this bloody garment to pay the price for their sin, for their disobedience. And for over four, almost 4,000 years, this was the case. Blood had to be offered, but yet no one was ever saved by this blood. It bought him a little bit of time is all it did. Hebrews 10, 11 says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. See, the Old Testament believers, the, the ones we read about in Hebrews, the, the, the hall of faith, we read about Moses and Abraham and Isaac. We read about these guys. They were saved, not by what they did, not by their works, but by looking forward to a promised Messiah who would one day die for their sins. They knew that everything that they were doing was leading up to this point where God would send the Savior of all mankind to earth. See, the Old Testament sacrifices did nothing absolutely nothing to remove the sin, but the death of Jesus on the cross dealt with the sin forever. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, going on in verse 12, says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering, one, 
He, was, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. When you believe in him, when you make him Lord and master of your life and you look and you say, yes, he is the son of God. He came to this earth as a baby. He walked that perfect life. He died that substitutionary death on the cross for me. And he arose victorious from the grave and he's sitting at the right hand of the father interceding for me today. It says he has perfected me. That's the beauty of the cross. That's the beauty of the plan. So the Old Testament believers were saved in a completely different way. Today, for us, we're reading a book. We're reading a history book. And we aren't looking forward. We're looking back to a promised Messiah who actually did die for our sins. See, today, the only way you can be saved, it's not by a ministry that you're involved in. It's not by some work that you do. It's not by how much money you give or how faithful you are to the church or anything else or how nice you are to the poor or the people around you. All of those things are great. All of those things are wonderful. But you are saved by one thing. That is, you have to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ to stand in heaven. The blood is the only thing that gets you to heaven. 1 Peter 1, 18 says this, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hallelujah. That is the plan. See, I don't have to worry about, oh, did I make the right sacrifice? Did I, did I follow the correct um, procedure? Did, did I bring the right animal? It's been paid for. It's been done. I come under the blood. I come under the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so the plan is finished. And not only is the plan finished, the payment is finished as well. Because, see, God, it, to, to, to have a mutual business agreement, you know, um, you go and, and you're trying to get the best deal you can, right? You know, you, you, you want to get it as cheap as you possibly can. Well, the person selling the item has to agree to the price. You just can't simply come in. Well, maybe if you're Elon Musk, right, with everything he's trying to do with Twitter right now. He can come and say, this is what you're getting, period. But most of the time, the seller says, no. I want more. I don't like that price. You know, so you go back and forth. You make a deal. And God looked at the price that was paid and the payment, and he accepted it. He accepted the death of his son. He accepted the shed blood as the perfect payment for our sins. See, the Bible writes it this way. Paul writes in Romans that Jesus became the propitiation for our sins. Romans 3, starting verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth as the propitiation by his blood through faith. To demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So this word propitiation, it's kind of a big word. You know, we put it into songs. We talk about it. David's talked about it in some of the songs that we've seen before. But this word propitiation has this idea of appeasing, covering. And so it refers to this idea and th th this is where Bible history is so cool. It refers to this idea of, you know, the Ark of the Covenant that, that the Jews revered so much. The Ark of the Cover Covenant, where, where, where God would live, it, 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 it refers to the covering that would go over the Ark. The place where the temple priest would apply the blood on the Day of Atonement. That's what we're talking about, the propitiation. Jesus became our propitiation or that which satisfies and appeases God. That's what we mean by propitiation. This is the payment for our sins. So we started off looking at tetelestai being in the Greek, meaning it is finished. Now, if we look at Tetelestai and we look at the Hebrew, it's more accurately um, translated as the sacrifice 
is accomplished. So yes, it is finished. Because why? Because the sacrifice, the final payment, the final installment has been made. That's what we're looking at here. See, we can never ever do anything or be good enough to pay that price. I can't do it. You can't do it. We talked a little bit on Friday about this, is that no matter who you are, deep down inside of us, we're sinful. We're sinful. We do things that don't please God. We do things that don't please our, our mate, our spouses, our family members. We're selfish creatures. But yet, we can never do enough. I, I, I can never work hard enough to get to God and to get to that point where he says, yes, that is sufficient payment. But since Jesus has already satisfied the Father, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about, oh, did I go to church enough? Did I say the right things? Did I do the right things? Did I give enough money? Did, 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 did I work in the right ministries? Did I do this? Did I do that? I don't have to do that anymore. Because see, it's like this. If I am in him, if I believe in him, I say, yes, he is my Lord and master. Then the father accepts Christ's propitiation, Christ's appeasing, atoning death for me. And God will receive me as his son. That's the payment. That's the final payment. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him to him. To them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. The propitiation, the appeasing of our sin, the payment for our sin. Because it is finished, because Jesus cried out on the cross to tell us die, there is nothing more that you can do to contribute to his work on the cross to bring you any closer to salvation. You can't do it. You know, we, we, we don't do works to be saved. Because we are saved, we do good works. The works come out of us, not because of who we are and what we want to do. The good works come out of us because of Jesus Christ's atoning death on the cross and because of what he's done for us. Hallelujah. When you are truly found in him, you are accepted by God because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's nothing that you do. It's not your works. Philippians 3.9 says, and, be found, and to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. See, Paul understood this. Paul was a man of the law. He understood all of those rules and regulations that he kept and all those things that he did, did nothing to appease God's wrath. The only thing that appeased his wrath was the death of his son, Jesus Christ. So if you can accept this today, if you can accept the truth that Jesus Christ gave up the splendor of heaven, came to this earth as a little baby to walk this earth, to live a perfect, spotless, sinless life, to heal people, to perform miracles, to preach the word, and then, how do we repay him? We crucified him for nothing that he did, for just being Jesus. He died the substitutionary death on the cross. And that three days later, on that resurrection Sunday, the tomb, that 4,000 pound stone was rolled away. And Jesus walked out victorious holding the keys to death, hell, and the grave. If you can believe that, and, and you can believe that his blood will wash away your sins, you can be saved. That's the beauty of it. There's nothing else that I can do except have faith in what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. Paul writes it this way in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, it is finished. It is finished. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do. It is finished. And because Jesus cried out, it is finished, we, we, can, still, we can enjoy salvation through the blood of Jesus without having to fear 
that I'm not good enough, that my works aren't good enough. Because, see, he accepts me. He accepts you just as you are because you have accepted his son and the price his son and the payment his son laid out for us on the cross. See, Jesus, I I love this little um, quote here. Jesus plus anything. When I try to add something to the work of Jesus, when I try to add something to what he did for me, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. I don't have a thing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. When I focus on Jesus and nothing else and the price that he paid for me on Calvary, that's when it all becomes real. That's when, as, 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 as Paul, on, before he became Paul, when he was Saul, and the scales are lifted from his eyes, and he sees it for what it is. He understands now that there's nothing that he can do. All of those works of the law did nothing for him, but now he's living in Jesus, and he understands he now has everything. See, Jesus said it is finished. And we need to stop trying to fix what has already been healed. We need, to quite, we need to quit trying to help God along in these situations. And see, today is Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate the day that he rose from the dead. And I'm going to tell you today, he is still resurrecting the dead today. Because I, got, I was thinking about this 28 years ago, I was a dead man walking I was living my life my way, how I wanted to do it, and and I ignored, and I I, I scoffed, I ridiculed all of those things of God, but yet God is still resurrecting those dead souls today. The Word is alive today, and your heart, when you believe on Jesus Christ, you are resurrected alive again So do you know Jesus? Do you truly know who Jesus is? Do you you, you just know of him? See, I was a dangerous one because I knew enough. I knew enough just to say the right things to get people off my back. But when God met me face to face, when God spoke to me through his word and through the people that he chose to use, all of a sudden it became real. All of a sudden, I I didn't have an answer anymore. I didn't know what to say because I knew who Jesus was, but I didn't know Jesus. If you were to die today, right now, are you 100% certain that you've been washed in the blood and that someday you will stand with Jesus in heaven? If the answer is no, I've got a great answer for you. It's simple. The Bible tells us really easily, all we have to do, believe, repent, and be baptized. Acts 2.38, Peter was preaching to the crowd. It says over 3,000 people came to know Jesus because of this. And Peter said to them, because they said, what do we do? We hear all this. What do we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think it's so powerful as Christians that we let the world know. It says over 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. They were added to the body of Christ that day. And they were willing to stand up in front of a hostile environment in in, in a world where they would be crucified themselves for their beliefs. And they said, no, I am going to show the world that I believe in Jesus Christ, that I believe he is the Savior of all mankind, that he is the Messiah. And they willingly partook in the believer's baptism. We need to show the world that it is over. That this old self, my old person, is dead. It is gone. It has died. And it is being buried under that water. And when you come up out of that water, you are alive. You are new. You are that new creature, that new creation that Paul talks about. Hallelujah for the resurrection. Because that's what happens. Your old self has been dead. It is buried. And you come out of that water alive. You come out of that water, a new creature, a new creation in Christ. To telestai, it is finished. But Jesus is just getting started. 
Hallelujah. He is alive today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. I thank you for the price that Jesus Christ paid on the cross for each and every one of us. And Lord, I know that there's a lot of us here today, Lord, and, and, and I know there's people watching online and may, maybe they know you or may, maybe their walk hasn't been what it's supposed to be. And I just pray today that your Holy Spirit just begins to work in their heart and their lives and that you just begin to speak to them and show them exactly what it is that you would have them to do in their lives for you. Our Father, maybe... They're here watching online and they don't know you as their Lord and Savior. And I pray today, Lord, I pray today is the acceptable day of salvation. I pray today is the day that they say, yes, I believe. I believe. I repent of my sins, Lord. I, I'm ready to follow you in believer's baptism. I'm ready, Lord, to be your son. I'm ready to be your daughter and follow you and say goodbye to the things of the world, to to. to Watch that old self die and to be buried and to be resurrected, Lord, anew with you. Hallelujah, Father. I pray today that that is the cry of many hearts. And Father, as we close this service today, we thank you. Father, as we are 2,000 plus years down the road from your crucifixion, I thank you, Lord, for the price that was paid at Calvary. Let us never forget the cross. Let us never forget that you were resurrected from the tomb and that today you are sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for each and every one of us. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.